what organisms are important and how to identify those. And that's what I'm going to cover here. So there will be a lot of uh, repetition of what I've already talked about. Uh, I don't know if that is available, uh, visible from the back or not. Uh, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That describes by a terrorism of any kind, really. It's the fear that it invokes in people. Uh, there's another, uh, that was a FDR's, from a quote from a, one of FDR's um, speeches. And there is a German proverb, fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. Uh, if you are sitting in a sort of uh, crowded um, theater or cinema hall and somebody sort of shouts fire, obviously the re reaction is to rush out and um, in the process cause a lot more damage than um, the, perhaps the fire would have caused. Uh, so that, that's the sort of thing about bioterrorism. What I'll talk about is a little bit of history um, a little biowarfare and bioterrorism, why, why biological agents uh, can be used or and are likely to be used as tools of bioterrorism, uh, potential biowarfare agents that uh, are um, classified by the CDC. Um, it was a very hot topic several years ago, of course, then when they, just after 9-11 and then anthrax, scare, and so forth. So um, there is not as much emphasis on it now. But at that time, of course, there were seminars and uh, instructions everywhere. And we have kept that, you know, just so that give you some perspective, you know, as to how to be prepared if such a condition does occur. Um, a little bit of history. 14th century, cadavers of plague victims were catapulted by Tatars. On the, over the wall to, into their city in hope that the population, they will destroy, there were no A-bombs to cause massive destruction, okay? So they used that as a means. The, the, the war, I guess, does um, produce, or thought of war, or process of war produces uh, innovative ideas, um, like catapulting the and you see there's a, here's a depiction of uh, that cartoon or um, painting depiction of that. That obviously is from History Channel. You can see that there. It's there. <laughs> okay. Um, 18th century, smallpox contaminated blankets were distributed by the British to the Indians. That's another example of um, old bio warfare, just a typical scenario of Indians, and uh, they, they were provided for the winter protection with blankets that were contaminated with the smallpox uh, virus. 19th century, livestock contaminated with anthrax and glanders. Glanders is uh, another organism, Barcaldaria species, and that causes, um, um, here it, it says here, uh, the, the disease called glanders, okay? Uh, it's an organism that is normally in horses, but it has, it can in fact produce a sort of debilitating infection in humans. In 1925, Geneva Pr Protocol was written, and that, um, you know, that um, banned or is, the text was that or the biowarfare agents should be banned. But it didn't stop anybody, really. And um, anthrax, smallpox, tularemia, glanders, cholera, hemorrhagic fever, that's a virus Dr. Hunt will talk about, diphtheria, were all, et cetera, were used by the Japanese in a variety of organisms during the Second World War. Um, the British dropped an anthrax bomb on an island. They were the first one to test, actually, the, um, a bomb that would be bio-agent bomb. And um, on an island off the coast of Scotland, and you'll see a little picture for that, I think, later on. And in 1972, biological 
and toxic weapons convention was held uh, and it is ratified by 140 different countries or more and yet they all have and continue to have a stock of biowarfare. So it, uh, no conventions and no protocols stop people and some people stop people from at least developing it, stocking it, and some people not even not not even in, and in, for some people it doesn't stop them from using it either. World War II. To the end of Cold War, USA, Canada, and UK had biological warfare programs, official biological warfare programs for Dietrich in this country. And here's a picture of somehow I got from the internet, Guarnata Island. Um, the 42 decided to develop an uh, effective uh, bioweapon using anthrax. Sheep were taken to Grunard Island off this coast, coast of Scotland, and they were fenced in a, an area so that they cannot escape. And then the um, a, 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 a anthrax bomb was uh, dropped, um, and the spores were scattered around where the, the sheep were there, of course, indiscriminately over the island as well. Um, the island is now known as Anthrax Island. And if you go on the internet, you'll find very cheap property. <laughs> okay? But because people do not want to go and live there. Um, although that fear, again, is mostly fear because um, unlikely, because of the treatment, unlikely that it will still be contaminated. And the British, again, in 1986, they an English company was given a contract of half a million pounds, which at that time was probably about two dollars to a pound, so it's a million dollars to decontaminate the soil there. Um, 520 acres of island, uh, island was soaked in uh, formaldehyde, 280 tons of formaldehyde, and um, in diluted water, in diluted 2,000 tons of water. Even after that, some organisms could be found, okay, deeper in the soil. Because it's, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's for survive for a long time. And that's what I was trying to tell you. Uh, during the, in 1973, a map that describes the biowarfare activities of Russians, and um, uh, they, they're called bioreparat, I guess that means biowarfare or bioagent. There were a huge staff there working. Uh, there were several establishments that were responsible for the A field test site um, on an island, I'm not going to even pronounce it. The English translation would be Rebirth Island in the Aral Sea. And they, they had their smallpox, anthrax, plague, tularemia, glanders, um, Venezuelan is, uh, equine encephalitis that Dr. Hunt will talk about, the virus, and Mar Marburg or Ebola virus um, that is also very deadly. How many of you have heard of Ebola virus? Okay. How many of you have uh, read the book Hot Zone? It is an interesting book. It's a fiction, not fictional, actually. It is semi-fictional. Docudrama, that you could call it, um, that type of thing. Um, the characters in those, that um, you can almost recognize them if you were involved, associated with the people in, um, in the uh, army, in, in, uh, who, who, uh, in the armed forces. Dr. Ganjemi, who will be giving some lectures uh, he has some colleagues that did actually uh, wor work in the project there. They were, of course, interested in finding a cure or growing the virus, characterizing the virus, and uh, that was traced, of course, to African, Africa, and Dr. Hunt will talk about Ebola virus. It um, causes very, very fatal um, uh, hemorrhagic uh, disease. 
Okay, moving into more modern history, 1943, the U.S. launched the biowarfare program in response to Japanese experiments on um, uh, prisoners of war. Okay, because they, you know, they, they wanted to protect themselves. Most of the Fort Detrick, there's a, you know, just outside Washington, D.C., there's a Fort Detrick military establishment and a lot of research laboratories there. There's a virology lab, bacteriology lab, and so forth. And some of our contracts, actually, for research were money came from that for development of vaccines against or um, uh, therapy to approaches against some agents of biowarfare. So it's live and well. Uh, in 1969, uh, Nixon signed um, bio-agent weapons ban treaty, um, disbanding our nation's offensive weapons program. So after that, it was not a bio-weapons development, but protection against bio-weapons. Um, in, however, in, as late as 1979, they still had a bio-warfare program uh, in this area of um, Russia, and um, there was a, an accident there, and um, there were about 96 human cases of anthrax. Okay, that is the, the, the official number. The unofficial number is over a thousand. And um, what happened? There were about 68 deaths. Official response was a tainted meat. But the, it was traced to uh, laboratories here, the organisms. Uh, pathology uh, was inhalation anthrax, of course. They were, by accident, some of it was released, aerosolized, spread over uh, several miles. Um, uh, human, human cases were up to four kilometers away from the actual research area, and the animal kilometer, uh, up to 50 kilometers, of course, because they got exposed and may have migrated a little bit further out. Okay, um, incubation period, up to 43 days after the first cases, they were, up to, you know, they were uh, detected. Dose uh, uh, model, one gram was by accident released, by accident or on purpose, we don't know. Okay, so that was the international level. What about that home level? There's a good history, or bad history, I should say, of um, uh, incidents of uh, bioterrorism, not organized by governments in terms of wars, but by individuals. In 1984, Dales, Texas, and Oregon, salmonella in a salad. Okay? Well, there is no reason to suspect bioterrorism, but you know, how many of you still don't eat spinach? Okay. I mean, that could be, it was not, but E. coli or other organisms can be spread that way to, to uh, in, in fact, a number of people. And I'll tell you a little bit of history of this one. In 1991, Minnesota had a hoax of toxin how many, did you do toxin, uh, ricin toxin PBL this year? Last year, I should say? No. Um, there is, used to be a PBL with ricin toxicity. Okay? Very toxic um, uh, extract from um, castor beans. Um, in 1994, Saren, how many of you remember that? The subway was in a, they had released, a group had released um, sarin gas, very toxic gas in the subway, in a train. Um, there were many, many deaths and uh, uh, certainly exposure related uh, conditions uh, among the people who were exposed to it. Um, uh, Arkansas, rising again, but the hoax, fortunately, but the hoax is just as bad as the real. A few, uh, years, I think last year, one of the lakes in uh, 
South Carolina. Uh, they suspected ricin being there, uh, but later it was turned out that it was either very low quantity or it was a false uh, positive result. Washington, D.C., again, anthrax hoax, many, many of them. Uh, in 1998, Nevada, non-lethal strains of bacillus anthracis were found in private possessions. Some people were growing it. Um, people, I, I suppose people did not know that uh, they were not the real virulent strains. Um, in 1998, again, multiple anthrax hoax. And these are individuals, unfortunately. However, the net result is not is no different. So there, there are many incidents of that. Uh, to give you a little bit of uh, Tokyo, here is the person who was heading that group, um, Aum Shirin Riko. I don't want to I want to pr pronounce it. Okay, that was the group, and uh, that's the name, I guess. Okay, uh, they, that was uh, 1995. Um, sarin gas was released in metro system, 12 killed and 5,000 injured. Because, of course, there is a panic. They are stampeding. And uh, that's the major effect of bioterrorism or any ter terrorism of any kind. Research on anthrax, botulism, and Q fever were found in possession of the group, of the group in their headquarters, they also had acquired eight deportive biological attacks they had conducted um, or tried to conduct with the anthrax. The same group, uh, same group again tried to uh, obtain Ebola virus from Zaire in Africa. So they were really intent on killing. Ma uh, at, the ma at a massive level. Um, they, they were, aircrafts were found in their possessions uh, with, that were equipped with spray tanks. So their plans were to go ahead and spray over a large area or population. But the only one thing that they did, were able to do is um, the uh, train incident. And here's uh, some pictures are from that era published in the newspapers. Okay, the salmonellosis that was intentional sabotage of um, food, uh, actually it was uh, vegetables, salad, uh, salads and vegetables in Dale, uh, Oregon that I mentioned, uh, had listed, there were 751 cases of salmonella. And salmonella is easy to grow. You can isolate it. At one stage, actually, before 9-11 and before the anthrax incidents, you could, I could just pick up the phone and order most of the pathogens from the American type cultural collection. And they'll send it to you. All I had to do is pay them, okay, or send them an order on a university um, the letterhead. They have tightened now. It's much more, or actually fairly difficult to get any pathogenic organisms from uh, ATCC. Um, and these cases were result, had resulted from um, eating at salad bars in 10 different restaurants in that city or in that town. And you'll be surprised when you know who were involved. Criminal investigations identified perpetrators as followers of Bhagwan Rajshri Najnish. He, he was a member of, or a head of a cult, the Hinduism cult sect that people were followed. If I, I may be mistaken, but uh, my impression is that he, remember you used to, or you may not have seen, uh, yellow toga sort of dress, shaven heads, people at the airports and other places. And there were lots of people who were followers of this particular. And what was the motive? The motive was that they can infect the, most of the population in town, and they had one person uh, running for mayor of that city so that their candidate could win the election and be the mayor, and they could control the town. Um, it did not happen as it is. 
he was arrested and deported. And um, okay, I, I think that I've got a duplicate slide. Here's the gentleman who was responsible for that. He was obviously, once they found him, he was deported from the country. And uh, interestingly, a few years later, he needed some, he had some cardiac problems, and he applied for a visa to come back for treatment. Needless to say that it was declined. And he did die at the age of 58 or something, some young age uh, in India. So there are people, crazy people everywhere like people going into high school and or into the school and killing Amish girls or you know or going into a McDonald's and shooting a whole bunch of people okay Dallas Texas there was a case 12 of 45 laboratory workers that kind of makes up about 27 percent over a quarter of the workers in a large medical center had severe diarrheal illness, diarrhea, diarrheal illness. And that was tracked down to eight of them, positive stool cultures for Shigella dysenteriae. And a molecular analysis of those organisms indicated that they were all related, okay? Uh, eating, and that w was tracked down to eating muffins or donuts in a staff room uh, of that particular hospital. Okay, and the story goes and is that um, there was a, n a nurse or uh, one of the workers needed some attention to take care of the people or whatever it was, and she intentionally. Uh, had brought in muffins and donuts that was, were laced with Shigella organisms. Okay? Uh, they were, you know, when, when I looked into, uh, got the information, there were still investigations, but I don't know what happened. happened. Okay, in the recent one, the 2001, that we come down to, at uh, 2400, Okay, and this slide you've already seen, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to, okay, this is the sort of epidemiological history of anthrax, lots of cases uh, before 1957, it tailed off to more, no more than one or two, and then you saw that um, other slide, there were two postings of uh, male contaminated with anthrax, four of those um, letters, were found, 22 cases, uh, one laboratory individual. Uh, they were all, in, uh, but, I mean, most of them, half of them were inhalation and anthrax, five deaths, and 32,000 prophylactic antibiotics had been used, and extensive decontamination. Later on, there was a contamination of um, the um, our uh, Congress building, of course, and that took hundreds of thousands of dollars to decontaminate and clean. And um, during that period, there were thousands of false alarms. People thought it was funny to um, give pass. There was an incidence of a young man going to the uh, teller and uh, handing in an envelope with some powder, and it did not have anything uh, and it did not have the organism. But the net effect is still the same. Fear. Okay? Why bioterrorism? Most of the agents are cheap to produce. You can grow organisms in your garage. Okay? All you need is to inoculate some blood agar, agar place or proper medium and then leave it even at room temperature if you don't, can't afford to have an incubator. And a lot of the organisms will grow, including anthrax, uh, or tularemia, or Yersinia. Um, simple to produce, but there may, you may have to come up with some inventive ideas about um, uh, spreading them to deliver. Uh, spray bottle, 
just share a all the spray bottle and go around all the restaurants in in um, Colombia. Okay? I mean, the, the people who want to do it, it's not difficult. That's why bioterrorism is uh, one of the modes of uh, f- uh, spreading fear and causing damage. Defense is difficult because until it's diagnosed and you know it, okay, uh, because the, it's not, the, it does not target a specific group of people like armed forces or soldiers. It targets just about anybody. Uh, you cannot detect it, you know, by any detection system. You, you, you can't uh, have checking people uh, or stopping people not to bring in a bottle uh, into a restaurant. So the expertise are available. There, you know, it doesn't take much to train as a microbiology laboratory person to be able to grow these. And most importantly, one case, and it causes panic. Um, And that panic results in devastating effects. Or the organism itself may cause. Effectiveness, if we look at the cyanide, just look at the comparison. You can, in a 5 ml vial, which when I go to public, I have given some public lectures, ah, this diameter and about this, up to this mark, that's about 5 ml. Okay, maybe a little bit bigger, more. Okay, that's about 5 ml. Okay, and in 5 ml, you can have enough for 50 lethal doses of cyanide. Mustard gas, 100 lethal doses in the same volume. If you take sarin gas, 5 100. If you take botulin toxin, Botox, that's the same toxin, it's just with the quantity that is used for cosmetic uh, purposes. Uh, Botox, about a million doses. Anthrax, 50 million in the same volume if it is properly prepared. Um, Tularemia, 50,000 million, well, less billions of them in the same one volume. If you can aerosolize inhalation, remember, one to 10 organisms can cause fatal disease if not diagnosed and properly treated. So that is just where I'm giving you some perspective, and that's what you've got to remember, you know, not actual figures, but relative effectiveness of these. What about the reports? 1996, there were very few. 97, few more. Up to 150, 99, 250, and it has gone up as you know that it is continuously going up. We are worried about our airports, we are worried about all sorts of things. And that is not the worst part. The worst part is resources. Our resources have to be diverted to something that we could use um, those resources for something more constructive. Look at the amount being spent. Billions of dollars, okay? Uh, less than five, uh, less than five, 50 million, okay? Um, close to 100 million. Look at that, 96 billion, 2004, the estimate was 123 billion, and it has not gone down. So that is an enormous strain on economy. How many agencies are involved? I won't even go around deciphering those, just to remember, just to give you an idea, not just the army, but um, uh, FEMA, DO, Department of Defense, National Security Council, Treasury, Environment Protection Agency, FBI, and so forth, and so forth. As if they did not have anything better to do. Since 2000, or uh, during the last four or five years, uh, the CDC has categorized certain organisms, and they have category A, B, and C, 
and that is on the priority list in, the, in terms of priority, which organisms are most, um, one, ha one has to know uh, as a bioterrorism or biowarfare agent. Anthrax is, sits at the t in that list. A, plague, Yersinia, we talked about Yersinia. Okay, so you know the organism, both of those organisms. You know, you've heard of the smallpox, and even now there are, is effort and there is, the, the vaccine is being stockpiled. Healthcare workers, a number of healthcare workers are being immunized, have been immunized, so that they can be a resource for working in case of any epidemic. Smallpox is one of the viruses that has been eliminated from the world. Okay? Uh, Dr. Hunt will tell you about tularemia. I told you about. You have already known. Uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, Dr. Hunt will talk about. Botulinum toxin that uh, Dr. Fox already talked about. And then there, there are agents because they can easily be disseminated transmitted from person to person, like anthrax, plague, smallpox, tularemia. Um, you know, those can be from the person to person, all of these. Botulinum toxin, of course, you can't uh, pass from person to person. Uh, they, they have got high mortality. You saw the mortality rates uh, for those. And they, most importantly, they cause public panic and social disruption. Category B organisms, Q fever, Dr. Hunt will talk about it. Brucellosis, we have already talked about it, told you about. Uh, glanders, Bacalderia melii. Um, it's, I have not uh, talked about it, nor have Dr. Fox, but it is one of these zoonotic organisms. Maybe I'll include that next year in the enteric pathogens of different varieties and other toxins are in category B. And I'm not even going to go over in any detail category C. These are all viruses, very, very exotic and very rare viruses, and they're difficult to grow, so they are not really the top priority organisms to be aware of. Okay, and yellow fever, Dr. Hunt will talk about, tick-borne encephalitis, she will talk about, and, of course, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Difficult to grow, but it's possible. Okay, potentially, or potential for high mortality for these. Route of infection. It can come by skin, cuts and bruises, abrasions, uh, mucosal membranes, you know, respiratory mucosa, um, Inhalation of spores, like in the case of anthrax, or tularemia. Aerosol, again, many organisms can be aerosolized, um, and then sprayed over a large area. Uh, one to five um, or fewer droplets uh, are quite effective. Okay, um, gastrointestinal route, food. Spinach, you know, poisoning or smash-related infection, meat-related infection, they were accidental, not um, deliberate, but they, the same way uh, bioterrorism agents can be spread as well. It's frightening. Um, potentially a significant route of uh, delivery. <clears throat> Secondly, to either purposeful or accidental exposure to aerosol, uh, you sort of ingest. Water supply can be contaminated, and that if water supply, a large population can be affected. But the good thing about it is that the, it can be diluted. A lake mare is big enough that it will dilute most, almost any organism. Okay. Um, water treatment, also to water is treated, so most of the organisms are going to be destroyed. So that's not as significant or as um, effective a route. What can we do about it? Awareness is the most important. Open eyes, keep on seeing. If one sees a number of cases in a certain area, small town or small community, then you think of what is going on. It's either deliberately affecting something or bioterrorism of some kind. 
uh, laboratory preparedness. We have got laboratories in place now that if you see something and you suspect, you call C uh, DHEC here, DHEC is in touch with CDC, and there is a network. There's a network of education as well uh, for, for it. Um, plan in place. They have got, they have no, they know what to do from there onwards. You don't have to do it, but they know what to do. Um, individual and collective protection. If you have got an office, and there was one time there was a recommendation that at least one person in that office, somebody, a trained nurse or somebody should be aware of what these organisms can be. Um, detection and characterization is important, and that's done by CDC, and if they can't do it, uh, DHEC, I'm sorry, DHEC first, and then CDC can do it, They're, and their regional centers. What can be done? Emergency response. Okay? Measure to protect the public, health safety. If there is one case of smallpox, that's enough, because the smallpox has been wiped out putatively from the world. If there's one case, well, one cordons that area and then can, tries to contain the disease. Um, uh, treatment. People are coming up with the treatments. There's a lot of money being spent now in the stockpiling of uh, smallpox vaccine, just in case. Um, and some people have already been, uh, uh, you know, uh, have already been uh, immunized against the smallpox. Uh, safe practices, if one identifies such a disease, how to handle a specimen or how to handle even how to manage those patients. Uh, American Academy of Family Physicians has got some suggestions. Know to contact local and the state health department. In our case, is DHEC down the road on Bull Street. Okay? That's their uh, recommendation. Um, you should be aware of it. Have a chart on the wall or somewhere. That preparedness, that is the main, main uh, key word. Uh, maintain contact with the local health officials. Um, maintain reference material on the uh, diagnosis and treatment of agents of bioterrorism. Develop bioterrorism response. Plan for your office. Be prepared to use infection control practices. Be it quarantine, be it something else, but um, preparedness is important. Know the requirements for laboratory support. A few years ago, I went to a seminar and a workshop. There are people who simulate lesions of smallpox, lesions of anthrax lesions, other simulated actors that they are using for training physicians. There's a center in Kentucky, Bioterrorism Center in Kentucky, and a microbiologist is in charge of that, and they have such resources. Uh, beware of proper post-exposure management for both patients and the healthcare staff. Uh, develop skills in, uh, and resources for counseling patients to minimize the psychological consequences, the fear, the terror, terror Okay, so those are the things. Most importantly, one should not panic. Panic leads to damage. So one does not panic, but one has appropriate, practical ways of coping with those situations. And as physicians, when you are physicians, bear in mind that, you know, that if such a situation arises, what you are going to do. So know your organism, know what to do if there is a case, such cases. And there are the hypothetical cases that are used for training purposes. Okay? And here is one. City of 1.2 million, several military establishments around there. Okay? A 28-year-old woman with two-day history of fever, malaise, fatigue, improved in two to three days then presented to hospital with severe respiratory distress, dyspnea, stridor, 
and shocked and cyanosed. Okay. The chest radiograph. What did I say or point out when we were talking about the anthrax? Widening. Okay. And that's a characteristic um, chest X-ray radiograph. So she was exposed to um, anthrax. Um, IV ampicillin, erythromycin, uh, within 18 hours was given, but she continued to have respiratory distress. She was hypotensive, rapid deterioration, and death. If there are multiple cases around some military base, well, we've got Fort Jackson here, okay? So if you see that, you know, there are many, many cases of anthrax, it's not natural. So looking for abnormal patterns is very important. Uh, encapsulated gram-positive rod uh, seen on blood film, uh, tachygranular BI uh, non-hemolytic colonies on blood agar uh, from uh, fluid. Here is the organism. Okay, and the colonies, and 20 similar cases over the next week. That's anthrax, and 20 cases of anthrax is not natural normal, and that's the pattern you've got to look if you are going to. At postmortem, a hemorrhagic thoracic lymphadenitis, hemorrhagic meningitis. Okay, that is what um, will be the postmortem finding. Diagnosis, anthrax. I, didn't, I told you right up front, but when you see all those things, diagnosis is anthrax, and if there are 20 cases of anthrax, it's, not, it's definitely something suspicious. So suspicion is the what you have got to bear in mind, not go around telling everybody that, oh, there are 20 cases of uh, anthrax. Newspapers serve a purpose, but newspaper papers also and media also cause a lot of damage. They produce copycats, they produce hoaxes, they produce, uh, or they cause the production of those things, uh, those groups of people. So, okay, I'll quickly just finish this one to only two 50-year-old male visiting New York City from Santa Fe. Okay, you, this I made up, I think. Within two days, with a two days of history of painful unilateral inguinal swelling. What was it? Plague. Yes, bubonic plague, and here's the, I've used the same picture as well. Okay, and these are all in that um, handout, or not handout, the PowerPoint that you have already got, and we have already gone over. And these slides are from the same thing. Treated with gentamicin, doxycycline, ciprofloxacin, vancomycin, deterioration. The, the whole case is the same one. I'm not going to divide the same thing. Okay, so. Those are the things, that, that's the reason I have emphasized on the history as well as the, what's the normal epidemiology of a disease and where you should be suspicious. If you see 10 cases of plague within a certain area, let's say southeast instead of southwest, beware that there's something fishy about it. Clinical three, five-year-old female presents three-day history of malaise, headache, and fever, that's a different organism. I'm going to, this is the last one. No previous history of illness and, uh, and all immunization on schedule. So it's nothing that is normal. Maculopapular lesions on palate and skin. The skin lesions continue to increase and become raised and filled with fluid over the next two days. I don't think you've seen the organism. I don't th think we have. I have presented to you, and the lesions look like this, okay? And then develop to be this. And one thing you see that when they were few, they were all about the same morphology, same similar size. Majority of them are the similar size here as well. So the size has not changed. It's the numbers have changed. And that is a typical characteristic feature of, let's see if anybody wants to guess, Smallpox, absolutely, smallpox, which is not, um, there are no natural cases of smallpox. There have not been since 1971, I think, 70 or 71. 
Diagnosis is smallpox. What to do? If faced with suspect cases, seek expert advice as soon as possible. Okay? That's, that was all. So the, the key points really are not many, except that what are the organisms? You've got to be familiar with those organisms and why they are potential agents of bioterrorism. 